those of you on Instagram, welcome back to Elise TV for the, I was going to say the Tuesday show, but I think it's Thursday. Uh, who knows we mentioned this last, uh, we mentioned this on Tuesday. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm having a tough time tracking the days right now. They're all <laughs> starting to, to blend together. Um, today's show is going to be another one of those really fun, uh, interesting uh, uh, shows to play around with. We're going to be talking about Merlot all day. Don't log off! Okay, I'm, I'm tired of you people bad mouthing Merlot out there, and it's time to step up and drink some of the great wines of the world. Um, matter of fact, if you go back to some of these families that have been growing grapes for hundreds of years, Merlot will show up in their lexicon of, of fruit that has been uh, planted for years. If you look at Napa Valley, some of our most epic mountaintop vineyard locations and some of our best soil locations for growing red varietals, the Bordeaux varietals, Merlot will have a very, very big presence there. The infamous Three Palms uh, north of St. Helena, Bancroft Ranch, Keys Ranch, Pride, Paloma. I mean, these are epic locations for Merlot planted around the, uh, the Napa Valley. So some of Merlot's bad reputation, I think we can attest to aggressive farming from a marketing standpoint, thinking it was going to be the next uh, uh, wine everybody had to have, so to speak. And I think a lot of Merlot got planted in some inferior locations, which can explain a lot about certain wines and why they weren't as compelling as they could be. That being said, we're going to launch right in. Um, the first thing we're going to try today is a 2016 Merlot, and we refer to this as our Napa Valley Merlot simply because we did not source this particular wine from a single vineyard. Um, this is all um, uh, Stag's Leap fruit, um, and that provides its own interesting kind of character in that Stag's Leap is one of these really beautiful appellations within the Napa Valley where super warm sunshine, but this little secondary little canyon that runs parallel to the Silverado Trail, all of the lungs of the valley, all of that cool air coming up from San Pablo Bay runs right in that little canyon. Merlot certainly likes a little cool weather uh, to go with its location. Brother Garrett, what you yeah, got? Yeah, let's talk a little about Merlot, one of my favorite grapes on the planet. Uh, gets a bad rap, and we can touch on why as we go through the show. Um, but Merlot can be in cool climates, can be in warm climates. Uh, within the warm climates, where you're gonna see the differences will be, is it dry, rocky, volcanic soil, or like here in the valley, that's up in the mountains. The valley floor, there's more water in the soil, that's more of a sandy, loamy, or alluvial soil. Uh, so you're gonna get different characteristics based on that. Where we're starting here, the Napa Valley Merlot, Stag's Leap, they have a little bit of their uh, soil climbing up into the, the hillsides, but nothing's super high mountain uh, type soil. So a lot of this is more closer to the valley floor. Those are going to get more fruit oriented wines, more juicy fruit uh, flavors. So Stag's Leap, one winery, two wineries? Oh, an let's not have the apostrophe conversation, <laughs> man, you know? I think they, the Hatfields and Lacoys settled their dispute way back in the day, man, you know? So one is the leap of the stag, and one is multiple stags leaping is how they worked that out over the years. Uh, but um, it's a lot more than just those two wines. And it's also a sub-AVA of the greater AVA of Napa Valley, and there are many wonderful wineries and vineyards within that Stag's Leap AVA above and beyond the two wineries. It's pretty cool when you drive up the Silverado Trail here in Napa though, you really get a sense of that terrain because right when you hit this long straightaway out near Chimney Rock uh, and Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, mm -hmm. that you all of a sudden start up this hill and the elevation changes by almost 100 feet in about a mile or so. And that starts to show you that terrain of moving into the, the kind of the, the mountain valleys. You go further north up uh, up the valley there. So it really is one of those those times. You know, on a sunny day in Napa, you don't get a sense of microclimates and weather. It takes these foggy, rainy days to see why when that elevation changes, the storm might be in Napa, but it's blue skies and stags leave. It's really fascinating to see the terrain uh, uh, through there. Um, I got to tell you, right out of the gates, this is a 2016 uh, uh Merlot, and I gotta tell you, it needs a little bit of time uh, just to kind of wake it up. But I got it, this thing has got dense fruit. When I look at Merlot, blueberry is always something I'm going to come back to. It, it, for me, it kind of it, it's what drives Merlot in terms of a nose or a, a profile. 
Um, and the other one, I know it sounds like a, a geek thing to say, but cola berry. There's something about almost that, that Coca-Cola aroma sometimes that can come off the top of the You Mello actually had a cola thing. berry? Uh, I have never. never actually had a cola berry, but when I... Should we, no, we should buy some? All right, anybody out there on the front of that, like, generic, generic or has anyone actually flavor? eaten a gooseberry? No. I've laid a goose egg. Yeah. <laughs> Super <laughs> low hanging fruit in a gooseberry. One time Josh actually yeah. made me stop in a grocery store buying gooseberries nice. because we saw them at Ardina DeLuca in DC. Nice. Common descriptor for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc gooseberry. Yes. They weren't that yummy. <laughs> <laughs> Better <laughs> descriptor than a real thing, right? You know? Yeah. Um, but that's how sometimes I think when you put your nose, and that's a word I think we might start banging around a little bit more during some of these shows, which is typicity. You want to tell somebody Love what that, that word means? Word. Uh, typicity uh, is a word that describes really the all-encompassing factors, and we use it towards uh, wine grapes and varieties, that goes into creating what flavors come out of that grape. So typicity, just let's just talk about Merlot. There are many different flavors that are common with Merlot, but if you're in a cool area of China growing Merlot, which actually is uh, starting kind of to take the reins of- Very the, serious farming going on over yeah, there. Some of the innovations the and the dedication. Area, yeah. yeah, I've really been impressed with the uh, the dedication for Cooler sure. climates, you're gonna get different flavors than warmer climates. Yao so. nice work out there, buddy. <laughs> Um, so typicity, uh, and, and Psalms will use this when wanting to do blind tastings. They want whatever they're going to be tasting to be typical of what you would expect from, in this case, a Merlot. So if it's grown, grown in, a uh, Iceland or Greenland, let's say, and they don't, they don't uh, show any characteristics that are typical of Merlot, that wine would not be described as typical or having typicity. Um, so Merlot, Merlot is a workhorse of a grape, uh, which is part of, its, part of its charm, but also what kind of led to its demise in a way, because grown for quality over quantity on the right soils, like we have here in Napa Valley and really along the west coast of the US, uh, you can make some of the world's best wines. But if you're growing it, in different areas and their ob objective, those farmers are to grow quantity over quality. Now you're gonna get a inferior product and that's basically what was put all over grocery store shelves in the late 80s, early 90s, actually all the way through the 90s, early 2000s. Yes, question. Oh. Trying to make um, the dog sit is not working. Yeah. Oh, sit. By the way, guys, Listen Bo, up. Bo is, is having a field day playing in the in the in the studio today, so he's just running around. Mm -hmm. Bo, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. There's Good only time. three of us here, so not many to play with him. He's like, oh, I love chasing We're all birds. birds. Yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta say, this the 16th. There's a little tan in there still. It certainly is dry, but there is that sweet vanilla. There's that juicy fruit. Definitely Merlot's role, and this is why it appears in Cabernet blends as well, is it loves the middle of your tongue. All the flavor and all the weight and all that density sit right there in the middle. And so if I'm blending it with, with Cabernet or Cabernet Franc, it's that weight, it's that satisfaction that Merlot's role can really play in the, in the blend. And occasionally what we'll do is we'll start out with a vineyard as a blending vineyard. It's really great to put with that Cabernet or that Cab Franc. As years go by and our farming gets more and more kind of integrated into that site, that's when we start separating some of those vineyards away from a blend going, I think this can stand alone. I think this wine has everything I want in a wine front to back. Those are some fun kind of uh, progressions we go through um, in, uh, in the business. Um, now, the Napa Merlot, again, multiple growers, multiple sources there in Stag's Leap. Now, we're going to go to Hosfeld Vineyards. Uh, Chad, Lucia, family. Hey, Hi, guys. Um, we have been pretty blessed over the years to uh, to get access to this vineyard. Um, we are going to start with the 13 today and work our way through 13, 14, and 15. Um, this site for me, when we walk vineyards and, and do the terra firma, um, there are certain sites that will always romantically grab my heart. Hostel, when you stand on top of this ridge, 
you look out across the Napa Valley, and then you look at the, the treacherous nature of your walk down that Coliseum <laughs> up there, man. Um, I think one of the great things about our business is how many other businesses can you legally get a license to purchase dynamite? I mean, come on, man. How much fun could that be? So the nature of the, the volcanic rock uh, up at Hosfeld was so intense. And again, this is what I love about farming. It's not like a farmer walked along and said, oh, that's going to be too difficult. I will plant somewhere else. No, I don't think so. <laughs> this is Napa, man. Like, you know, they're like, no, no, no. We're going to actually drill those metal pikes. We're going to jam a little nest into that rock. And put one dynamite, stick of dynamite yeah, per vine. Per vine. And fracture that rock so that when you put the vine in, it actually has a fracture. It can crawl down into the, into the subsoils and looking for water. So Hosfeld as a vineyard, at least in my experience, the more torturous the planting process mm -hmm. was, the more spectacular the results have been. Very um, much so. And I got to tell you, this Hosfeld fruit, uh, you have to lean closer to your uh, laptop. The color on these is absolutely remarkable. Um, opaque to the rim, dense, dark, uh, really a tremendous sight, and, uh, and being farmed um, by a family that understands that when you put your family name on a bottle that someone else is making, uh, the dedication to, to the farming and the perfection of your fruit and finding a winemaker that gets kind of what you're doing and can elevate it to that next level of the, of the wine. Those are the special relationships and we certainly consider ourselves, uh, again, blessed for, for getting to play with the Hosfelds. And how long um, have you been working with this vineyard? Well, I mean... I know Elise started in 2012, uh, but... Elise started in 2012 and I personally, we were working with this vineyard that's really funny. I think it was 2012 when I worked with it the first time uh, at, uh, at the, the previous project uh, at uh, Chateau Boswell back in the day. Um, and for us, it, it actually created one of the greatest wines we ever made where we made Petit Verdot and Merlot blends back in the day. And the, the vineyard was so strong that it, it became a personality worthy of, of what we consider one of the best wines we've made back what, in the day. Uh, what is your nickname for this vineyard? Or when describing the Hostel Vineyard, you've done it here in the tasting room. And when I started with you, I was, I'm, not, I'm a snowboarder, love the snow, love this the is, mountain. This is my double black diamond vineyard, man. Love Any it. of you ski lift types so up there, steep. man. It is really steep and it's that broken up volcanic soil so your footing uh, can be really fun. And, and the whole site before they fractured the rock and started planting their vineyard was easily one of the largest poison oak blooms you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> life. And to this oh, no, day, I need to visit that, one. that poison oak will still find uh, uh, paths up through the fissure up into the vineyard. Um, and so you'll be walking along, you know, checking on the, on your block and you just have to keep your eyes on the swivel because all of a sudden, blam, there's another poison oak bloom that'll, uh, that'll happen up there. Um, so it always feels like, uh, a, a, a true adventure, uh, going out to the, uh, to the site there for sure. And for those at home, if you're wondering about flavor components and everything real easy, as far as the Napa Valley Merlot, you're going to get more juicy fruit. Not that you're not going to get plenty of fruit with the Hosfeld wines, mm. but more juicy fruit up front, sweet, soft tannins, where the Hosfeld wines are going to act more like a Cabernet in a lot of ways. More structure, more power, but also with beautiful finesse, and that's what you get from volcanic sites, really dry, rocky soil that are really stressed. The more stress that a vine has, the more complexities you're gonna get out of the wine. Yes, So are there any food pairing differences between Cabernet and a Merlot like this, or would you say they operate for the same profile? It's an outstanding question. Um, I find for myself that Cabernet and my pairings tend to leave me more inland. I'm looking for more hoofed animals. I'm looking for biggest, bigger forest flavors like the mushrooms and whatnot. Merlot for me has always been a coastal wine. I can play around with things like duck, Fowl. Mm -hmm. Again, we just did a, an event uh, down at that Avondale Golf uh, 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 Club in uh, in Palm Springs, and we paired the Hosfeld Merlot with a salmon on the cedar plank with a with a hoisin uh, glaze. And I have to tell you, it was a spectacular pairing. It really did do well. So uh, in that case, I think I find myself with Merlot kind of leading a little bit more towards the the coast, so to speak. So then where exactly is Hosfeld in Napa Valley? I love that you raise your hand when you have a question. That's awesome. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I, I don't know when you're going to be done talking. Do I have a statement and a question? <laughs> uh, 
uh, Hosfeld, uh, when you are heading up uh, into the Napa Valley, and right before you actually get to that Stags Leap Winery, there's this long straightaway. Just before that is one of the greatest locations uh, for a sandwich on the planet, known as the Soda Canyon Store. Anybody that's lived in Napa uh, for enough years knows the gang at Soda Canyon. Thank you for saving my life on many days. <laughs> uh, back in the day, there was an old Chimney Rock golf course, and so the Soda Canyon store is always where you stop for supplies before... Mm, uh, first uh, place I ever played golf. Going to the, uh, the course there. Uh, thank you, Hack, for putting a golf course into the Napa Valley and then later tearing it out to put vineyards mm -hmm. in. Thank you very much. So anyway, where the Soda Canyon store is, this little Soda Canyon road takes you back into the canyons and Hostel's located in the Rolling Canyons just to the about a mile off of the Silverado Trail. Uh, and then from there, you get kind of Atlas Peak rising up to your south in the mountains there and then Stag's Leap uh, staring at you to, yeah, the, the, to the north there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Epic location. This 13, this is what I love about wine. Beautiful. This 13 is still trucking along. Like, this is here we are seven years in, and I mean, this has got years and years and years of, of excellent, <laughs> dense performance out of the cellar still coming its way. In the time that we've even had it open, it has changed a couple of times and keeps progressing and keeps coming around. Um, again, fresh blueberry, that sweet vanilla, the little tobacco leaf, yeah. uh, and, and one thing I get from all of these uh, Hostel wines is this cool herbal flavor. It's definitely not an underripe thing. It's not a bell pepper thing. It is like bay leaf yeah. and mint, um, and it's just classic of that site and their soils, and even if you look on their, on their website, which actually was nice to reaffirm, oh, yes, I am tasting these things, because they say the same thing. Um, but beautiful wines and what makes the west coast of the U.S. and all the great wine regions of the world so great is they're warm enough during the day to get the fruit ripe, but then they have the cool down at night because it's usually not a high humid area. So you can have your 90 degree days and then have a 60 degree nighttime in that same day. Uh, so that diurnal shift is the fancy word for that. But it one quick one sec on the question it helps to preserve the acidity and this seven-year-old merlot beautiful structure and tannins but finishes with a mouth-watering finish which kind of uh, exemplifies the uh, acidity in the wine a savory quality so is merlot as hardy a grape as cabernet sauvignon or is it a little bit more finny? in the right location i would say absolutely um I, it, it's interesting that uh, a shout out to our neighbor paul camuzzi man he is such good people uh, he brought us a case of wine out of his cellar because he goes, I'm drinking at a good clip, but I'd like some help with it. Um, and tasting the wine with an experienced wine drinker like him, it, it was a case of location sometimes in that I can make a well-structured Merlot from a location like Hospital that will satisfy my Cabernet mm -hmm. drinker. Um, I can also make a more, and the reason I brought this is Paul brought us Italian wine to play with. In, in Italy, a lot of times, your vineyards are always described as masculine or feminine. And so we can talk about Merlot being a feminine expression sometimes in the red wine world. Again, it, it's 100% based on location. I think oh, the man. more velvety and soft the wine is, the more they describe it as feminine. Uh, they don't travel in the same circles I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a different, that's a different subject, TV-wise. Um, but yeah, I think the, the business side of it was Merlot was planted more widely, and that's where it got maybe some of the inferior locations back in the day, because it was being promoted as a good business decision. I can blend with it. I can make 100% with it. Um, I don't know if it was the first time I saw it was Italy or California, but white Merlot kind of caught me off guard. They were making that. A, almost like a, a negative blush, but a white version. Because again, if you come visit us in, in October and, and drink wine with us during harvest, um, when you take red grapes and crush them the day they're picked, the liquid is clear. It's absolutely clear. It doesn't pick up its gorgeous colors until you soak the grapes in their own juices and whatnot. And so, obviously, that's how they made the white Merlots. But anyway, it completely threw me off it's guard. just like white Zinfandel? Uh, I think that was the approach. And, and I think it was also some growers understanding that maybe their site wasn't going to be able to achieve a good red version but all grapes are useful in, in some fashion, and I think that was the attempt to play with some of those sites to see if there was another avenue the grape could take, you know, instead of ripping and replanting and, and, and that kind of thing. And back to the question and building upon uh, what Christopher um, had started off with is Merlot is 
usually medium to medium plus bodied, where Cabernet can be anywhere medium, medium to full bodied. Uh, but we were talking about this earlier, and I saw a video based on this exact subject today uh, while I was brushing up. But for me, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon are two of the hardest things to decipher between when I'm blind tasting because they can be so similar, uh, especially with this Hossfeld site. Here in the tasting room, I get a feel for the group. The group will usually say, no, I don't like Merlots. I drink Pinots and Cabs. So I will always pull out a Hostel Merlot, <laughs> cover the label, cover the back label, and pour it for them. And then they're, basically they go straight to Cabernet. So. And that's a good place to interject. If you like someone to torture you through blind tastings, <laughs> make sure to rec ask for Garrett yes. when the least tasting is back up and running. I've uh, had only one negative response <laughs> to that. And well, people are weird. They're right? like, I want to know what you're pouring. Not, don't you dare. Yeah, like, you know? thought I was going to play games or something. But everybody else, I think, has enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. So then one quick question. Do we have any plans to make a Merlot Petit Verdot blend again? You know, that to me is never dictated, you know, the Russell Bevanar winemaker has taught me a lot of powerful lessons over the years, and I think one of the most powerful was the vineyard, if you farm it properly, and I think if you make enough wine that reflects the sensitivity of sight, the vineyard itself is going to tell you what it wants, it really is its completion. And, and I think when we acquire uh, the kind of Petit Verdot that would magically match up with something like uh, the Hostel again, I would love to bring that blend yeah. back to our, our portfolio. Um, it, was, uh, it was just one of those crazy serendipitous wines where we were often offering wines out of the barrel before bottling dates. And we just happened to have a crew one day, and I had a barrel of Merlot next to a barrel of Petit Verdot. So we would put the Merlot in, in half the, the couple's glasses, and the Petit Verdot in the other half of the couple's glasses. They would taste their own, taste each other's, and then each couple would mix the two glasses together and try it. And everybody came away with this like chocolate covered blueberry scented magical wine. And so after a while, we're like, we should it. put this yeah. in a bottle, well, man. You know, what? I just heard a story about you in barrel samples. The uh, the line was, if you try to pull a sample and the thief not pulling any more wine, you know, Christopher probably used it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, they call it eulage, don't they? Isn't there a word for that with a wine? Is that a sample? Or you just uh, put your mouth under the barrel. <laughs> So that was always when we had to do the, the meetings about, uh, you know, here we, we harvested this vineyard, how many barrels did we get out of it? And then comes bottling day, you know, like, like, <laughs> wait, 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 the gallons wait, don't add like, up. Where, where did this other barrel go? We're like, oh, these were for samples of the cave, you know, like, I'm not quite sure. And, and I will tell you, certain things out of the barrel are not as fun until they're bottled. Merlot is one of those grapes that you just, you can just pick yourself picking that barrel up and just taking a big draw right out of it. Uh, they're really juicy and fun to play with. Uh, well, that's also with Petit Verdot in mind and mm -hmm. the fact that Merlot is so often blended into Cabernet or there's some Cabernet blended into Merlot, just because it says Merlot on a label, you know, this is across the world, there could be 95% Merlot, 5% Petit Verdot, and that's why you get this dark, inky, you know, you can't even see through through the glass, but in my mind, I'm looking at the bottle, it just says Merlot, so I assume it's 100% Merlot. There's a lot of those going on, and... Well, in our world, we call it 105% Merlot, because anybody can stop at 100. <laughs> <laughs> Ours goes to 11, yo. So what do you think um, about this 14? The 14, it's really, I love doing the progression like this because you already start to see um, now all of a sudden the savory quality of the 13. Mm -hmm. Now I'm getting the fresh herb I just added before it's integrated into my dish. There's almost a white pepper element that's coming uh, with this 14, which again is kind of letting me know that the um, intensity of this wine is, is giving me a view of its longevity as well. Um, but the fruit on the 14, it, yeah. again, it's fascinating. When we do 13s and 14s, we've done a couple of times. Fruit. Yeah, you can see with our 14 mm -hmm. vintage that we learned how to grow in the conditions 13 was telling us it was going to be the drought years and the lack of moisture. And Merlot loves a little wet feet in terms of its vineyard. So for us, it's always interesting to see that learning curve. And 14 is just this juicy, it polished, beautiful. Yeah, someone else is drinking it on the stream, too. Oh, Who's that? Awesome. The 14? Mr. Nelson. Yeah! Hey. Thank you for enjoying. 14 is one of my favorite vintages here in Napa, technically regarded as the third drought year, 12, 13, 14. 
anyway, it was interesting to me as I was working at a winery in the 14 vintage and then seeing it mm. to fruition in the bottle, it didn't make sense to me that there was going to be more fruit in the third year of a drought than the second. 13 is a much leaner, really intensely structured wine, beautiful structure, and 14 has that as well with more opulent fruit. And so it's kind of fun to do these side by side. Mm. They're both phenomenal wines and both have aging potential. There's a refreshing Minimum quality below too. There's almost like it, each sip replenishes the previous one. And that's another thing about the 14. Usually when you get more ripe fruit, that means it was a warmer vintage and acidity is usually not as high. 14, at least with Cabernets and Merlots, you get the opulent fruit, but there's also that mouth-watering acidity. So, Garrett, do you have a favorite vintage from 12 onward right now, or is your heart not uh, set? It all depends. Uh, for me, this 14 Hossfeld, but then I had the 15 Hossfeld earlier today. <laughs> so we'll see how that tastes, because it got no decant time or anything. Sorry, I was taught by farmers. 2019, best ever. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was that by farmers or well, the so I have to say, we, I've gotten like five messages saying we have to make a white Merlot. I don't know if I like the word have to. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, they were pretty specific about it. So. We'll call it Ricky Town. <laughs> <laughs> that's for you, Faith, in case you're actually remotely logging on today. You know? um, no, it, uh, um, yeah, I love the juicy quality of this wine. Um, there is a, uh, a satisfaction to me for a wine that normally when I drink a wine, I'm always going to be cooking, you know, the, immediately a food wine or immediately a, a you know, drink alone wine. There's always going to be that style for me. And for me, the Merlots coming off of Hossfeld are giving us both. I can absolutely be satisfied Great. and stand alone and drink this, but man, is it just And we are, all of these. by the way, right? There's no food hidden down here. We are just drinking. Although we did prepare our palates today uh, prior because Chef Chloe, God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you're going to see Chloe. a lot more of Chef Chloe coming up. Uh, as we're going to do uh, some shows where we're going to start playing with a lot more of the culinary aspect and, and doing some live cooking. Um, so when she sets me on fire, we've got this whole thing worked out. It'll be awesome. Stop, drop, and roll. Oh, yeah, stop, drop, and roll. Um, but she took one of our Dry Creek Zins and did a Coco Van with it. Uh, and let me tell you, it was the perfect way to prepare for this. Mm. But the whole time I was drinking, I was testing the Merlots, getting ready to go live with the show, and God, did those yeah, two go worked. well together. As I was tasting that, I didn't do the tasting, but I'm like, this would go great with the wines we're drinking today. Yeah, great job, Chloe. And thank you for bringing us in the samples. Thank you. We've got the neighbor delivering one. We've got Chloe delivering two. I'm just saying, days. man, are we having a day or this, what? Uh, this man? COVID <laughs> thing, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, something that I'm getting more off the 14 than the 13 is that mocha, like dark chocolate and coffee combination that is beautiful and matches, pairs up beautifully with the blueberry, blackberry flavors. Yeah, I definitely think the 13 reminds me more Cabernet-like, whereas I think that 14 is giving me much more of that pure Merlot kind of yep. uh, sensation Juicy. for sure. So is coffee from the fruit or from the barrel or both? Uh, I'm going to go barrel on that answer. My experience in the cellar is that very few grapes are going to give you the espresso coffee world of flavor by their nature. Um, you want to throw phenolics out there, there's another vocabulary word, man, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but tried to your, describe that one. Toast levels on the barrel will elicit either your sweeter, savorier flavors or more of your cocoa powders and your espressos. Vanilla, by far, is certainly one of those, those kind of louder barrel announcements uh, in the wine. Um, for us, the coffee or espresso, so to speak, uh, a flavor that makes its way into the wine, um, is the same reason you add a little coffee when you're making a chocolate cake. What's the first thing a good pastry chef is going to tell you is that coffee takes that chocolate flavor and just pushes it. It explodes that flavor, makes it much more dramatic. So in our world with those barrels and those kind of toast decisions, that's exactly what we're doing is we're taking a little bit of that element and helping it to, to explode and, and push the flavors um, for sure. Now we're up to the 15s. And again, now we're into that, that you know, another drought year. And, and 15 was where, and the other thing about Merlot, unfortunately, is everything you hear about that troublesome in a vintage in the certain timing, springtime rain, heat or rain in the fall, Merlot is at its most delicate in every one of those tricky times. 
it, 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 it buds out, so it sends its little growth shoots out before a lot of other grapes do. It's an early ripener, which means now when the frost comes, it's in a really bad position. You get hailstorms, you get heavy winds, and you get a lot of what happens in Merlot vineyards is referred to as shatter. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're going to lose flowers and some of those grapes. The greatest thing about a Merlot vineyard, though, is you can shatter and have some trouble some springtime. You still have the same amount of energy, but now it's going into fewer grapes. There could be some silver linings where even these troublesome vintages like the drought years, you can really bring a really concentrated, intense wine to market for sure. The 15 for me shows that. It shows a little intensity for sure mm -hmm. that uh, and the density. And now we're moving a, into a younger vintage. And it's funny for me is the 13 to me seemed the most ageable so far. Mm -hmm. The 14 I would drink immediately. This 15 as we get into this is kind of making me think it's kind of right in, in the middle. Yeah. Totally. You get a little more round opulent fruit, but not nearly as much as the 14 has similar structure to the 13, but with a little more fruit. Um, I would love for the firmament yeah. out there to uh, to grab all three of these, 13, 14, and 15. God, the fruit on that 15, yeah, it's, though. more fruit. Man, that's good. Sure. I would love for people to grab six packs of these, two, two, and two, and play with them, and fire back to us mm -hmm. what you think. I would love to see people op open all three. We'll put together virtual tastings with you and, and, and do it together on camera. I'm always fascinated to see what people come up with, uh, especially as a lot of our, our clients and a lot of our uh, friends that come by the winery have been drinking wine for decades. And it's always fun to put things in perspective different than uh, than our own for sure. So don't be afraid to jump in with us out there. Yeah, that blueberry quality is kind of underlying in all of these, but I'm definitely getting a little more cherry out of this 15. Yeah, I've got for sure. Good call. That was Maybe a, as a... Who, who was it with the Bordeaux we're about to talk about, the chocolate-covered cherries yes. actually comes through here. Oh, I, I printed it out because I have to read mm. the, the... There are certain people in the world, uh, and Robert Parker being number one on my list, that has a vocabulary and a way of describing wine that I will never possess. <laughs> uh, although you do possess some exceptional descriptors. Uh, not all can be shared here on camera. <laughs> Well, sure they can. <laughs> it's time to put the kids to bed, man. We're going to do this after hour show here at uh, mm -hmm. least. Um, while we're enjoying this 15, though, I do want to mention uh, next week, Tuesday, Thursday shows, we got a couple of really fun ones coming your way as well. Um, on Tuesday, we have the Scutney family, uh, and that's Reed Scutney, uh, another generation uh, mm -hmm. of really exceptional Cap Franc, uh, a kind of specialty mm -hmm. uh, wine. And one of the great locations that we have found for Merlot uh, and Cabernet Franc is this area called Sugarloaf uh, uh, oh, yeah. down in Napa. We did some vineyard walks recently, and it is just one of those sites, kind of like Hospital, where we stood in this vineyard, and you're like, of course we're making spectacular wine. Uh, from this location. So the Sugarloaf uh, show with uh, with Reed is going to be great on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, everybody's got to get their big lighter so we can hold it up for the old <laughs> you know. Uh, Adam, if you're watching today, I can't wait for it. So on Thursday, we're bringing back uh, uh, Russell Bevan to the show, our winemaker, and Adam Duritz, uh, lead singer from Counting Crows, uh, being one of our absolute inner circle uh, friends here at, uh, at Elise. So we're going to do a show with Adam and, and some of the 18s, uh, 18 vintage wines um, that he got to be a uh, part of. And that is going to be an absolute blast. The only thing, Adam, and I just, I've told this to other people, so now i got to tell it to you. The only thing we regret is when it came time for you to get ready for a fresh hairdo and you, you, you cut off the dreads, we wanted to frame one here like our first dollar in the register kind of thing when you get a chance to do that. So if you're going to do it again, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll make that happen for you, man. You know? So anyway, so those are next week's shows, so don't be afraid to, to jump in on those. Um, and then we're also going to be playing around with some of the cocktail hour stuff. Uh, I know the Frias brothers are getting ready to do one that we're going to be oh, cool. part of and kind of jump in on. But kind of where we all just log on and, and start talking about how fun it is to drink other people's wines as well. Another and, great uh, small family operated uh, winery making delicious wines. And yeah, okay, so for one of the rare occasions, you know, we always promise you we're never going to pour wine on camera that you can't purchase. And technically you can purchase this one as well, but it's not from us, so, you know, who cares? Mm -hmm. So, we can't mention Bordeaux varietals without talking about their parents, and we can't do that without talking about Bordeaux, and it just felt right uh, to, to bring a, a, a Merlot onto the show from Bordeaux today. Uh, you know, Saint-Emilion, there are so many more 
vastly experienced Bordeaux, Bordeaux drinkers than myself. So I would love for, for our firmament out there, if they've already got these wines, to chime in about what they thought, <laughs> how it kind of pinged up against our, our Hostels and Napa Merlots. Um, in my experience, you know, Bordeaux is a whole different adventure. It needs structure, it needs time, there's a lot. Um, we are playing around uh, uh, today with the Chateau uh, uh, Framplegade Vineyards, which is basically like, you know, fountain of plenty. Um, when we start talking about Bordeaux though, you know, the original vineyards in this location were planted, what was the year? Yeah, I think uh, 400 AD. Thank you this very specific, much. Yeah, you know. Not that the chateau was around, but the vineyard was planted, the vine. Um, that kind of scale is just, it boggles Ridiculous. the mind, you know, yeah. Uh, but this is a 90% uh, Merlot blend coming out of Bordeaux we're gonna play with today. And um, similar approach, about 60% new oak, uh, and it's a 2016, so, and I say that, and I can already hear the Bordeaux drinkers out there wince. Yeah, why are They're you doing, going what? Oh, what are you doing, you know? Well, I challenged my Bordeaux drinkers to, to the last time you opened a Bordeaux and somebody goes, oh, that was the perfect time to open that, you know? Everybody tells you to wait. Mm -hmm. um, I like to attack them young and see what I've really got to work with and I'll make my decision whether I want to eat Yeah, one of the most common drink. questions we get, well, when should I drink this? And my immediate reflex answer is I'd rather drink a wine too young than too late. Yeah. Uh, so what we've done, we've decanted oh. this wine and I mean, even this 15, would uh, benefit for some, from some decanting, but we pop the cork because that's what we do. We pour it right in our glass and it's fantastic. So why would you do We did the same thing with this Bordeaux earlier and talk about closed and tight. So that's uh, a beautiful advantage that we have here in Napa Valley. Most people think of decanting as the guy again with the, the, I know it's a taste man, all right? Some select stuff, sending me emails. I know what the thing is called. We refer to it as an ashtray for those of us that have been table side for 20 years. Um, why would you decant a wine? Because normally you're thinking about sediment and taking the clear wine off mm -hmm. the top. In our case, as an impatient wine drinker, we decant for a whole different reason. Totally. Uh, oxygen is one of three main enemies of the preservation of wine. But when you want to drink drink something younger than it should be, oh, I just did the rabbit ears. I don't know about that. If you remember. Oh my God, that's right. Everybody's got a home has to drink. <laughs> rabbit ears. Um, <laughs> It is to allow the wine to open quicker. So it is basically going up that bell-shaped curve, opening, getting it ready to get to its peak for now, but then you leave it open too long and then it will start its... Let me climate. tell you, it was a great call because when we very first opened this, it was tight as nails and it was yeah, graphite we're actually minerals, getting that fruit. That, that dark fruit, the cherries are Lisa coming through. Ready, Brown? Is that her name? So someone asked, have you ever decanted using a blender? Does that work? All right. That's a great nod to Robert Mondavi. Um, old Robert used to tell people to put his reserve cabs in a blender on puree for about mm -hmm. 10 seconds. And people were like, have you lost your mind, you know? And Bob's answer was always the greatest. Well, if it helps you enjoy my wine more, I'm a yeah. big fan of the habit. Well, and yeah, one famous quote, eat what you like, drink what you like. Yeah. That was a Robert Mondavi staple. To Bob. Yeah, to Bob. He said, do you want your my Cabernet and your halibut? Drink up. So then we did get... So talking about using a blender, yes, I've done it before because I experiment constantly. Oh my God, did that open beautifully. Oh, wow. Um, the thing I love most about a question like that is it means that more and more people are making wine their own. This is the way I like to drink it. This is what I do with it. I love the fact that we're seeing a lot more of our wine drinkers out there kind of getting their own air and their own wind and kind of going, this is what I want to do with the wine. That to me is the most important step as a wine drinker is once you kind of decide your own path and what makes and brings you pleasure, you keep at it. Yeah. I would say, uh, making an analogy between wine in a blender to a mixologist shaking a gin martini. It's kind of the same idea. Purists are going to say no way. Um, but harking back to what Christopher just said, if you like it better that way, do it. It will oxygenate the wine. The thing with the gin um, and the mixologist, and that's the same thing with a Manhattan. You're not supposed to shake it. You're supposed to stir it. So that's why you'll see um, mixologist stirring gin or stir anything without sugar or a citrus, you're supposed to stir, not shake. But I bartended for quite some time and had people that wanted 
that gin ice cold, and they wanted the floating ice crystals on top. Which is what so James Bond orders So I guarantee you I'm going to shake right? that Tanqueray. James Bond no is like, I can drink it faster, shaken, not stirred. Wham, it's exactly. cold, baby, you know? And so that's yeah. the same thing with a blender. Yeah, just because three quarters of the master psalms or, you know, whoever says, no, that's blasphemy. If I like it be better that way, then I'm going to drink it that way. So you two. So while you're, while you're enjoying the wine, I have to read this. Mr. Parker, this is all for you. I love the way you talk about wine. So while you're sipping this, let's see. This is his description of what is in your glass. Well, I'm already agreeing with the graphite and the minerality. Medium to, to deep garnet purple in color. The 2016 uh, Fon Plegade opens with a very savory nose of smoked meats, tapenade, sautéed herbs, and beef drippings mm. over a core of plum preserves, chocolate-covered cherries, and cedar chest plus wafts <laughs> of violets and cigars. Medium to full-bodied, uh, the palate possesses both intensity and elegance, with the black fruit layers superbly framed by firm, fine-grained tannins and wonderful freshness, finishing long and mineral-laced. Mm -hmm. That's a party I want to go to, man. You know? <laughs> like, I love the way you talk about wine, man. Yeah. Um, don't you wish we could make tasting notes like that? <laughs> Cheryl's always asking, all right, I need tasting notes, and then there's there's a long pause. <laughs> but I will tell you, in, in my experience, this was one of the greatest calls. Well done, friend. If we did not decant this one, it would be a far different experience because of the tightness and the youth of this wine. But after being in a decanter for, what, an hour and a half or so? It was even longer than that. Yeah, it has really come on in a whole different way. So I go back to any, let's go back to the 13 Hosfeld. You know, mm -hmm. you pull a bottle like that out and it's a little dry for you, play around with decanting. And hey, look, this is a pretty simple decanter. The old Libby uh, fluted flower vase back in the day, the blender. Um, in my day, I used to use those old uh, uh, Paul Masson you know, carafes. Mm -hmm. Just get the liquid out of the bottle and, and back into the bottle if you want. But just the oxygen and giving it some time to wake up can do wonderful things for a wine. You might find yourself over time experimenting with wines at home and going, oh, that's a one hour decant for me. And that mm -hmm. one I can drink right out of the bottle. And that one I can decant and then drink it the next night. And you'll actually start to develop some of your own styles for, for you appreciating the wine uh, and, and it showing its best for sure. Definitely. And one uh, mistake, usually I see it with old world wines and people that don't usually experiment with old world wines. They'll open the bottle, pour a little taste, taste it, oh, this is garbage, and pour it down the drain. Just let that bottle sit on the counter. You might even revisit it the next day and be blown away by what it turns into. I'm shameless have been that guy at a dinner party go, you know what you guys are like, oh. you just poured all my glass, I'll, I'll take one for the <laughs> team, man. I got this, you know, yeah. Um, something else I want to mention, keep your eyes peeled for the Elise website and for an emails coming your way. The Napa mm. Merlot, 2015. Uh, the 16? 15 is going to be on a, on another on a special. Uh, special. The 16 okay. directly from Elise is going to be on one of those drink me, drink me, drink me specials coming up next week. And uh, I will tell you, and again, I thank all of you for your enthusiasm, but as we've launched these deals, they have been moving faster than I think we anticipated. So get there early, get there often, and you know, you'll be sure to get some at home. It is, uh, it is a great buy and a great wine. I want you to play around with these hostels. This makes yeah. a perfect mixed case. Three, three, and three of all four. Well, and also, I think we were talking about different ideas, and this is six months ago, uh, but I thought it would be brilliant, and I think these lineups would be amazing uh, with the difference, especially between the Hosfelds. But let's say, oh, there's not enough fruit on the Hosfeld, which actually you're not going to say because there's plenty. But this idea that we send it, you blend it, don't be afraid to... Uh, Oh, well, what happens if I take a little 14 and just this much and add it? Oh my God, blown away. And then preservation of wine too. If you have mason jars, if you're gather, if you're getting cocktails to go from local restaurants and they put them in mason jars, rinse those out, wash them, save them, because if you have a half bottle of wine and you're going out of town for two days, fill up that mason jar all the way to the top to where there's no oxygen gap, seal it, wow. put it in your fridge, then drink the rest of whatever's remaining, and then take off, take off for a week, come back. That wine is going to be as preserved as it can be and still taste delicious. Have you so been good. on the Pinterest wine drinking section lately? That's an amazing home tip. No, I invented it. 
Uh, <laughs> and all the uh, little uh, 10 ounce soda water or tonic water for you gin and tonic drinkers or ginger ales, save all those bottles because they come in handy. I've been preserving my wines. Usually I don't need to use them, but yeah, try and save screw top bottles of every size. It'll help. Awesome tip. Jeez, why, what a great roommate you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait to see your fridge. I can't thank you enough for uh, logging on to the show today. Again, you stay tuned, man. Next week's going to be another couple of fun yeah, ones. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'll be tuning in. Uh, cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Number a bottle a day, that's all we ask. Per person.